Miles made a quick video call to Uncle Foxworth Foxy Fowl from the yacht's lounge while the Marine Policing Unit response boat tied off alongside the Fowl Star. Uncle Foxy was the twins' only uncle, and while he was definitely a criminal and possibly a mastermind, he preferred to roll through life playing his piano and stealing a few bucks from the rich along the way when funds ran low. Foxy often joked that he was a little like Robin Hood and that he liked to rob from the rich, but where he and the thief of Sherwood parted ways was that Foxy preferred to keep his loot for himself rather than pass it on to the poor. So what if mother calls, all you need to do is say everything is fine? said Miles to his uncle, who was sporting his usual uniform of silk lounge coat and fluffed cravat. And dear Angeline will believe me, asked Foxy, tinkling on his piano as he spoke. I certainly wouldn't believe me. Miles sighed. They had been through this already, and he could hear boots on the deck above his head. Mother will believe you because I have sent digital avatars of Beckett and myself to your phone, he explained for the second time. As far as Mother is concerned, we'll be right there in the room with you. That sounds infernally clever, said Foxy. You must teach me how to do that, Miles, my boy. I will, said Miles. But for now, you have to trust me that it will work. Just cost money, nephew, said Foxy with a sly wink. Ten thousand pounds to be precise. Miles would have haggled over the cost of Foxy's collaboration on principle if he had had time, but he did not. Fine, uncle, ten thousand it is. Foxy must have realized that Miles was under pressure, for he added, Ten thousand per twin, that is. Ten thousand per twin, said Miles through gritted teeth, transferring the sterling within phone app. A bing on Foxy's phone signaled the fee's arrival. Capital, said Foxy. We have a deal and I'll see you later. Or rather, I won't, but your mother will. Miles, annoyed by his uncle hiking up his usual fee, ended the call without a farewell. Ripped off by my own relative, he fumed. It was not surprising that a fowl would make his money through extortion, but usually family members were out of bounds. There really is no honor among thieves. Miles realized now as he heard footsteps on the wooden stairs. Miles slid out from his seat in the lounge booth and stood to receive guests. He took a few breaths to calm down after the foxy blackmail call and glanced at himself in a wall mirror to ensure that his fresh gloop tie was falling into the center of the V of his fresh clean suit jacket. Look at him sharp, Dr. Miles, he told himself, then pasted on his always happy to see the police face, which he had learned from his father who had learned it from his mother, and on and on, back to the original mastermind, Red Peg Fowl. Miles' fake happy face was very convincing. He had, out of necessity, spent many hours perfecting it, as he was rarely happy to see anyone. Even members of his own immediate family were unwelcome in the lab if Miles was on a roll invention-wise. Only Beckett and, lately, Specialist Heights were spared this fake happy face and got to see the real thing, but they also had to put up with the scowls, frowns, and incredulous eye rolls that were Miles Fowl's go-to expressions. So, face prepared, Miles turned to greet the first person descending the short flight of steps into the lounge. And even though Miles considered himself a professional smile faker, that smile instantly turned into a frown when he saw who stood in the varnished wooden doorway. It was apparently his arch enemy, Lord Teddy Bleed Him Dry. The dude held up his hands and said, now, my dear boy, I know what you're thinking. I was thinking you were dead, said Miles. But now I'm not so sure. Ten minutes later, Miles was feeling a little less hostile toward the visitor, but he was far from smiling, which was not surprising considering the Duke's recent attempted murder on his person. This person claimed not to be the Duke, but the resemblance was undeniably uncanny. The company was seated in booth-style banquet seating, Fowl's opposite the Lord Teddy look-alike, who had given his name as Proctor Juvenalis. Except for his head, which had all the bleed-em-dry hallmarks, dark mane of hair, glacial blue eyes, and a nose so sharp it could administer paper cuts. Proctor Juvenalis presented as a very different creature than his deceased granduncle. We all went into hiding, Proctor declared. 
mother, father, and myself, because Uncle Ted was notorious for bumping off family members, anything to squeeze the whereabouts of the legendary Lionheart ring out of us and get him one step closer to the crown. Mother didn't care about titles and so took us off to New Zealand. We changed our names and made a life for ourselves. Of course, clever Mama kept a paper trail alive with solicitors, and so, as soon as the Duke passed away, I was notified in my Chelsea flat. I would snuck back to Old England, you see. Since Teddy has no heir, the title passes on to me, and I'm embarrassed to admit that I've dreamed of this moment. Miles wasn't surprised. Don't be embarrassed. You'd be surprised how many people dream of meeting me. The man who called himself Proctor Juvenalis laughed delightedly, as though someone had told a joke. Miles did not laugh, and Beckett helped Proctor out. But people do dream of meeting Miles all the time, because of his big brain. Of course they do, said Proctor hurriedly. The great genius Miles Fowl and his intrepid brother Beckett. But I'd also dreamed of being Duke of the Silly Isles. But mostly meeting me, Miles pressed. Absolutely, said Proctor graciously. That was certainly my number one dream. Very well, said Miles satisfied. Continue. Proctor Juvenalis took an envelope from his messenger bag and slid it across the table toward Miles. This is why I'm here, Miles, if I may call you Miles. Miles opened the envelope, removing a sheaf of documents. No, you may not. But no need for formalities outside an academic setting, so rather than Professor Fowl, you may refer to me as Dr. Fowl. Proctor was taken aback, even though he had heard the stories about the precocious 12-year-old. Of course, Dr. Fowl, uh, apologies. Miles had a quick read, and while he did, Beckett studied the visitor. Proctor Juvenalis was a very different kettle of fish from his granduncle. For one thing, Teddy would be appalled at the lack of beardage on Proctor's chin. The younger man sported a small arrowhead goatee that pointed toward his navel, and his dark hair was coffee hipster long and tucked behind his ears. Wardrobe-wise, he favored a simple linen smock, which could have meant he liked Korean culture, Star Wars films, or had just discovered an amazing designer. But still, Beckett thought, it could be Teddy wearing a magic cloak of morph and jellyfish. Krakark, one of his Comorant mates from home, swore that morphling jellyfish existed and were working with the seals to hide entire shoals of fish. Beckett had his doubts about that claim, as the Comorant's brother swore that Krakark liked to tell stories and was just a poor fisherbird. But Beckett had no doubt that this Proctor person was not Teddy. Not because he trusted his own senses, but because he trusted Whistleblower's nose. The toy troll was concealed in the storage area under the couch seating and if he had smelled Teddy in the room, he would have scythed his way out of there and tore the Duke limb from limb. After all, Teddy had once hooked up the troll to a venom-draining machine in an attempt to extend his own life. No attack from Whistleblower meant that this person did not smell like Teddy, and as Whistleblower had once told Beckett, You can change a lot of things about yourself, but you can't change your scent. At this point, the toy troll had passed wind violently to make his point. What are we getting here? There are notes of rabbit and asparagus, certainly, but the core is pure warrior troll no matter what I eat. Whistleblower was right. A person could not change their core scent. No scent, no teddy. While Beckett was reminiscing about nuggets of troll wisdom, Miles was speed reading Proctor's document, blinking more rapidly than it usually might, as this was a memory trick he used to store information in his brain. After several seconds, he tapped the sheaf on the table, newsreader style, and passed it back to Proctor. I can see why you were anxious to find me, he said. Your window is very tight. Proctor swept the document into his bag. Extremely. When your yacht was not at its mooring, I was worried you might have returned to Ireland. Luckily, as the future duke, I was able to avail myself of SO14 services. Of course, said Miles. The Royalty Protection Group branch of the Emet. I imagine the cruiser alongside is under their command. It is, said Proctor. They have been most accommodating. Apparently, the palace is eager to have a more amenable duke in Chinderblain House. Uncle Ted was forever murdering people so that he might stage a royal coup. I am more interested in attending royal weddings and possibly having my own podcast. I see, said Miles. 
And would I be right in saying that there is a seaplane en route as we speak? Proctor confirmed it. You would, Miles. Uh, Dr. Fowl. One of my uncle's skyblades, which is coming here on something called Autofly. Of course, you are not obliged to accompany to St. George, but I would be ever so grateful if you did. I can have you back here by breakfast tomorrow. Miles still felt that he was being set up somehow, but the lure of what he had been offered was overpowering. A treasure trove of knowledge. A hundred and fifty years of research. Teddy had never been the greatest scientist, perhaps on a level with Artemis, but he had nonetheless had some spectacular results, especially in the field of longevity, using unorthodox methods and taking shortcuts that no ethical scientist would. I wonder, Miles thought. Would an ethical scientist take advantage of unethically sourced research? This, he decided, was a question for later. For now, it was imperative that he at least take a look at this research before he decided whether or not to scan it into his own databases. Would it be possible to see a sample of the Duke's research? He asked Proctor. I'm afraid not, said the next Duke. Everything is handwritten. More than 500 notebooks, I'm told, all meticulously detailed and dated. Miles didn't doubt it. Teddy had been nothing if not meticulous, until he lost his temper right there at the end. I need to confer with my twin, said Miles, swiveling to face Beckett. Here is a situation, he whispered to Beckett. Lord Teddy has willed his entire estate entitled to his legal successor, if one can be found, providing his research is turned over to me and only me. Obviously, the Duke rightly believed that I was the only one who could appreciate it. If I do not go to the island before nightfall tonight, then his estate goes into probate, and, knowing English courts as I do, I feel certain we will all be long dead before it comes out. Now there is a lot to consider here, Beck. Is this man genuine? Is the legacy real? Would it traumatize us to return to an island where we are all very nearly killed? We are impressionable children, after all. Beckett had a question, which he whispered back. His name sounds made up. I'm not great at Latin, but I think it means young teacher. Does it have any other meanings? Miles was surprised to find that he was a little hazy on Latin at this precise moment, even though he had been fluent yesterday. He could not have realized that he was suffering a little from the mind-dulling influences of the Tower Bridge Mortuary Spectre. He could not realize this because he was suffering a little from the mind-dulling influences of the Tower Bridge Mortuary Spectre. I'm sure it's made up, he said irritably, to conceal Mr. Juvenalis and his family from Teddy. I'll go on one condition, announced Beckett. Miles had been expecting this. You get to fly the plane? Exactly, said Beckett. And I'm bringing my wink-wink action figure in my pocket. You're not supposed to say wink-wink, brother mine. You simply wink. Got it, said Beckett. But I'm still bringing my action figure, which is just an action figure. Miles turned back to Proctor and repeated his brother's demand because he wished to ascertain exactly how much this visitor wanted the family title. As long as you can fly the plane, Proctor asked. Exactly, said Miles. That's our condition. We will go as long as Beckett can fly the seaplane. And we do need to be back here by morning as we are expecting a friend. Our very best friend, added Beckett. Proctor Juvenalis seemed to a little bemused by the blonde twin's demand. When you f say fly the plane, is that twin code or are you being allegorical perhaps? Beckett did not like the sound of that. I don't do allegoricals about flying planes, he said severely. Proctor took a deep, shaky breath. Very well, Master Beckett, you may fly the plane. Both ways! pressed Beckett. Both ways, agreed Proctor. And I can stay with my feet! Proctor looked at Miles. With his feet, for heaven's sake? Miles nodded. My brother has excellent foot eye coordination. Proctor Juvenalis must have really coveted the title of Duke, because after turning perhaps two shades paler and wringing his hands for a moment, which people rarely did outside of adventure novels, he nodded rapidly, perhaps a dozen times, and said, It's agreed, then. Master Beckett flies the entire round trip, navigating with his feet. I hope that seaplane has sick bags, said Beckett. Why? asked Proctor. Do you have a weak stomach? 
and then Beckett made an unusually ominous statement for such a cheery fellow. Oh no, the sick bags are not for me!